Hello, welcome to Hello, welcome to lesson 3, CE5361 surface water hydrology. The topic of this lesson is the hydrologic cycle and hydrologic data. The hydrologic cycle is depicted in the slide here and let's read its description. The water cycle, also called the hydrologic cycle, refers to the pathway of water in nature as it moves in its different phases through the atmosphere, down, over, and through the land, to the ocean, and back up to the atmosphere. When atmospheric water vapor condenses and precipitates over land, initially it moistens the surface and some amount of it is stored as interception, which later evaporates. As precipitation, and in a similar fashion, snowmelt continue, Part of it may flow over the surface in the form of overland flow or surface runoff, and part of it may enter into the soil as infiltration. This surface runoff soon tends to collect locally, either in puddles or small ponds as depression storage, or in gullies or larger channels where it continues as stream flow, which ultimately ends up in a larger water body such as a lake or the ocean. The diagram here in the slide depicts uh, many parts of the cycle just described there in that short paragraph. Stream flow is described by a hydrograph, which is the rate of flow at a gauging station as a function of time. So in the diagram, a generic hydrograph is shown. It's not tied to anything specific in the diagram. Um, only there to uh, show a hydrograph. The infiltrated water may flow rapidly in the near surface layers to exit into springs or adjacent streams. So that's what's um, depicted by these wiggly lines right here. So the rainfall comes in, soaks into the soil surface and works its way to that lake or stream before it ever enters the groundwater regime. Or it may percolate, as in these squiggly lines, more slowly through the profile to join the groundwater, which sooner or later seeps out into the natural river system, lakes, and other open water bodies, or the ocean. Part of that infiltrated water is retained in the soil profile by capillarity and other forces, where it's available for uptake by roots of, uh, of vegetation. So part of this infiltration component can be returned to the atmosphere through transpiration. Part of it is built up into the cells that comprise the vegetative cover. Soil layers and other geologic formation whose pores and interstices can transmit water are called aquifers. I don't have a picture of aquifers. When aquifers in direct contact with land surface, it's referred to as unconfined. The collection of points in an unconfined aquifer where water pressure is atmospheric is called the water table. Although the water table is not a true free surface separating a saturated zone from a dry zone, it's sometimes assumed to be the upper boundary of groundwater in an unconfined aquifer. The partially saturated zone in an unconfined aquifer between the water table and the ground surface is sometimes referred to as the Vados zone. So if you're in Star Wars and you are in the Vados zone, you have to be very afraid of Darth Vados. In an unconfined aquifer, the term groundwater refers usually to the water found below the water table. Soil water or soil moisture refers to the water above the water table. A water-bearing geologic formation that's separated from the surface by an impermeable layer is referred to as a confined aquifer. Stream flow is fed both by surface runoff and by subsurface flow from riparian aquifers. The stream flow resulting from groundwater flow is often called base flow. In the absence of storm flow or storm runoff caused by precipitation, the base flow is also referred to as the drought flow or the fair weather flow um, or the below those two. And so in the diagram here, Base flow is identified as this blue shaded portion of the hydrograph, and the storm flow is in this olive colored portion. Uh, so many uh, 
any real streams have um, substantial base flow, and that's something we have to concern ourselves with hydrograph analysis. But ephemeral streams, um, not so much. Finally, completing the hydrologic cycle is evaporation, which returns the water while in transit in the different flow paths and stages of storage along the way back to the atmosphere. When evaporation takes place through vegetation, it's referred to as transpiration. Direct evaporation from open surfaces or uh, soil surfaces and transpiration of biological plants are not easy to separate. Uh, they certainly weren't easy in 1988 when what I'm reading to you was written and in the present, and they're usually combined collectively as a term called evapotranspiration. Uh, evaporation of ice is usually called sublimation because ice can actually go from the solid phase to the vapor phase with no apparent um, time spent in the liquid phase, although I suspect that uh, true sublimation doesn't actually exist. But the transition is very quick. It goes from solid directly to vapor. And on sunny days in icy climates, you can you can't actually see it, but it, it appears that you can see it. You can watch ice um, almost off gas if the light's correct. While these distinctions are useful, the term evaporation is usually adequate to describe all the processes of vaporization. And here's a schematic of the processes from that uh, same little story. So this one's not my schematic. This is from Bruce Hart's textbook. Um, so we have precip, evaporation, intersection, depression, storage, infiltration, base flow, and stream flow. I, I kept this schematic because of the explicit showing of depression storage. Uh, that is a reasonably important mechanism in both engineering and scientific hydrology. So it needs to be uh, considered. So these pictures are pretty, but um, for this course, they can group. We can group things into just a handful of fundamental processes. Fundamental in the sense uh, that they 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 drive this block diagram. Um, so I've color coded these intentionally. So we have the precipitation process which brings water into our surface system. We have the three um, abstractions, evaporation, infiltration, and storage. And when the green block is satisfied, any excess it becomes runoff in the uh, red block. So the color coding is intentional. I'm, I'll try to adhere to this later on in the course when we talk about the computational hydrology. So pursuant to these processes, um, the main, a main practical objective of hydrologic analysis, computational hydrology, and engineering hydrology is determining the quantity of water in storage or transit at a given time and place um, free of direct human control. So we're using this block diagram and we want to understand the different parts so that we know where water is in the different compartments and then use that knowledge to do um, engineering uh, judgment. So when uh, and we're moving, we're segueing into hydrologic data, but bear with me. When a reliable record of observed hydrologic data is available, um, we can learn a great deal about behavior simply by analysis of that record. And um, to get precise, the approach is proper for stationary systems in predicting long-term behavior and general planning, but it can't be used for short-term in emergency forecasting. And that's, again, why we resort to the computational hydrology. Um, but short-term, things like um, behavior during a flood, or day-to-day -day resource management decisions. Now, reliable records 
are available for only a few locations over a limited period of time and often not where you need it. So in hydrology, the problem is that a method has to be devised to transform available data, which are of no direct interest, to the required hydrologic information. And we'll spend the rem a fair portion of this course, and you will spend your hydrologic careers doing that. Um, for instance, consider the problem of determining the flow rate of a river at a given location from either known flow rate or a point upstream or from a known rainfall distribution over the upstream basin. Um, that's rainfall runoff modeling um, in its uh, most primitive sense. And nowadays, that's actually reasonably tractable. Um, there's been a dramatic change in technology in the last 20 years and database collections to uh, enable that. But um, other things like deducing the basin evapotranspiration from just meteorological data is still quite difficult. Um, so before we move on to some more um, mundane parts of hydrologic data, I want to discuss something in a Bruce Hart's book. There's no particular slide to go with it, so just sit and listen. Sleep if you need to. On physical versus systems approach. And why is this important? Well, one of the reasons is my education, I was taught the systems approach, and at the time it seemed to be uh, very uh, promising. And then I encountered a whole aspect of the profession where the systems models were considered data from data, and the physical-based things were the um, cat's meow. Well, I, I, we, I could argue back that um, a statistical model is every bit physics-based as a physics-based model. Uh, the only difference is, is we're using observational construction of transfer functions to explain that physics. And in parts of it, we don't have a good understanding of which physical process governs the transfer function. But the physical modelers don't know either. So, I mean, it's... It's an ongoing conversation. Oftentimes when someone that brings that up as a critique of your work, um, it's not that they should be critiquing your work, they're scared of you. Okay, so enough uh, philosophy and maintaining a good self-image. Um, let um, I'm going to read from Bruce Hart's book a uh, paragraph or two on physics versus system. Quoting, the hydrologic literature is replete with attempts at classifying the methodologies and paradigms that have been used to transform hydrologic input into hydrologic output information. Until a few years ago, it had been customary to consider two contrasting approach approaches, namely the physical approach and the systems approach. In the physical approach, the input-output relationship is sought by the solution of known conservation equations of fluid mechanics and thermodynamics with appropriate boundary conditions to describe the flow and transport of water throughout the hydrologic cycle. This approach has obvious limitations. The physiographic and geomorphic characteristic of most hydrologic systems are so complicated and variable, and the degree of uncertainty in the boundary conditions is so large that solutions are feasible only for certain highly simplified situations. In other words, the property of natural catchments can never be measured accurately enough in solutions based on internal descriptions starting from first principles of fluid mechanics can be obtained only for grossly idealized conditions, which of course are approximation of any real situation. The hydrologic systems approach, also called operational or empirical, is presumably based on a diametrically opposite philosophy. In this approach, the physical structure <coughs> <clears throat> of the various components of the hydrologic cycle and their inner mechanisms are not considered. Instead, each component, however it may be defined, is thought of as a black box. And the analysis focuses on discovering a mathematical structure between the external input, for example, rainfall, air temperature, and the output, river flow, soil moisture, evaporation. <clears throat> 
The structure of this mathematical relationship is mostly quite remote from the physical structure of the prototype phenomenon in nature. Um, so the diagram I have here is most decidedly more leaning to this systems approach of explaining behavior. So I have a precipitation block feeding into a net abstraction block feeding into a runoff block. And <clears throat> the individual transfer functions I mean, at, the, at the point of this lecture are um, certainly not specific um, conservation mechanics statements, although we do take advantage of mass conservation at each of the interfaces to guarantee a mass balance, so you could still safely argue it's a physics-based model. This Lack of correspondence between the inner physical mechanisms and the postulated functional formalisms make this approach quite general operationally because it permits use of well-known algorithms and objective criteria and identification and prediction. However, this also underlies the main limitations of this approach. First, in assigning cause and effect, the definition of input and output variables is mostly based on intuition guided by past experience, and a danger exists that some important phenomena are overlooked. I mean, that's a legitimate critique. Second, the best that can ever be expected with a black box approach is a satisfactory reproduction of a previously obtained input-output record, even when such data are available, and it is difficult to fully accommodate non-stationary effects of the system also legitimate criticism. And it's impossible to anticipate subsequent hydrologic changes such as those resulting from urbanization, deforestation, reclamation, or climate change. I would uh, disagree with that. Those can be incorporated into a systems model. Because many hydrologic methods do not really fit in this physical versus empirical classification, a third approach was taken to be an intermediate one. In this view, the performance of a hydrologic unit, a catchment, is represented in terms of some idealized components or gray boxes, if you will, which correspond to recognizable elements in the prototype whose input-output response functions are structured after solutions of some tractable or suitably simplified situations of the physical processes perceived to be relevant. This third way is often called the conceptual model approach, and I would argue that that's the approach I'll be using in explaining the different pieces in this class. At first sight, a classification based on the three distinct approaches, namely physical, empirical, and conceptual, may appear reasonable. However, it's less obvious how this classification can be applied to specific cases. Indeed, one might ask what the difference is between physical and empirical. After all, the essence of physical science is experimentation and conceptualization. And moreover, the physical approach of one discipline is usually empiricism or conceptual model of another. Um, for example, Newton's law of viscous shear constitutes the physical basis of a wide area of fluid mechanics, whereas it represents a mere black box simplification of molecular physics. Darcy's law is the physical basis of much of groundwater hydrology, but in fluid mechanics, it's an operational approach to avoid, avoid the complexity of flow analysis in your regular and ill-defined pore network. Same dilemma is inherent in most um, other special concepts using hydrology. This ambiguous difference shows that the classification should be based on other criteria. Um, so continuing we, with that, um, you will encounter a physics-based versus empirical versus hybrid your entire career. Um, let's consider a brief example. So the HEC HMS simulation program that we'll use or the SWIM simulation program. Let's, let's consider the SWIM because I'm more familiar with certain parts of that. Uh, the, the SWIM program is a hydraulic model. So we can define a riverine system in SWIM and we have this concept of no of junctions and conduits. The conduits can represent channels, and the junctions just represent different places in space where those channels meet. 
and we can apply flows in the junctions and the computer program will calculate a water surface elevation and it does it dynamically so it's solving the St. Bonat equations and that's arguably physics based and it's it's well proven it's, it's a mature tool for that then we can attach to that a uh, operational hydrology model where we have the concept of a catchment unit or a uh, subcatchment, which I believe is the uh, conceptual name used in SWIM. And on that, we can have rainfall runoff process models. Um, so some of the ones that are offered up in the program are a curb number or a green amp infiltration. So those are one component. Those are loss. Those are infiltration models. But remember what they're doing. They're calculating this rose-colored runoff component. And those flows are directed into this channel system that's in the in the model. And so it brings up the case of what kind of model is that. It's, it is physics-based, certainly in the hydraulic sense, but it has this hydrologic component that's not totally dealing with the physics as we would declare it. And yet it's a useful tool. So I've just taken some time out of your life to spend on this concept and the end result is it doesn't really matter. Um, we have tools that are uh, mature and useful tools. What we have to do is design them for whatever application we intend in such a way that we can parameterize them. That is find values of the physical constants that are represented in the program and from that parameterization establish an input-output uh, response. Um, next thing I want to consider before we move on is uh, the concept of scale. And I'm going to pull into your viewing screen a chart right here that uh, has the approximate ranges of spatial and temporal scales of some processes of importance in hydrology. Um, let's look at the river basin scale. So up here in um, distance, we're in the kilometer to thousands of kilometers range in size. And the associated time scale with things in a river basin are frontal rains, and they have time scales on the order of days, and seasonal regimes in the order of months, synoptic weather patterns, order of weeks. So at a river basin scale, we're looking at stuff that occurs over days to weeks in sizes from a kilometer to a thousand kilometers. Let's go to a much more localized scale, more, let's consider that the engineering hydrology scale, scale of 10 meters, uh, which would be a grid cell in a gridded hydrologic model. Um, most of the uh, digital elevation models, getting 10 meter resolution is pretty common now. You can download that off the internet. Um, so. 10 meters is 30 feet by 30 feet. So parking lot, your, your, your resolution's at the parking lot scale. Um, that's considered hill slope or field scale. We have infiltration processes, overland flow, evaporation, and, and in, in those areas. And we're looking at time scales on the order of minutes to hours. Our computational hydrologic tools actually don't care, um, but if we misparameterize them, we, we can't effectively keep track of the uh, time scales. So for stuff on the order of minutes to hours, that's sometimes will be called event scale modeling, You're looking at the event. And we get up into the weeks and months, those are called continuous simulation modeling. Um, and the day, stuff at the daytime scale actually spans a pretty good physical range. And um, 
I will leave for you to read much of the remaining um, part of the first chapter in Bruce Hart. What happens next is a, a long treatise on um, fluid mechanics and then um, um, a section on the kinematic approach which is pretty similar to um, a lot of what we will use for rainfall runoff modeling. We may not call it that. And next I want to discuss um, hydrologic data. So um, there is a lot of hydrologic data available. You just have to be persistent and creative to find it. And as, as stated in the preamble, um, it's quite likely you won't find it exactly at the spatial location you need. But with the exception of certain parts of uh, New Mexico, West Texas, and stuff up there, um, where uh, they have Montana and Wyoming and, and the more remote population-wise remote parts of the United States there's data. Um, and then speaking of that remoteness when you have a need to examine behavior in other nations um, they collect data too but that's even harder to find for, uh, for the average researcher. Um, the key is persistency, and you have a tool that I didn't have 20 years ago, the, uh, the search engine on the internet. So if you can structure your searches correctly, or be persistent when you're doing those searches and don't give up on the first one, you can often obtain a lot of information. And um, you used to have to pay for it, it's actually amazingly free now. So let's look at um, one of the um, important sources for the input part, um, rainfall. So the National Weather Service operates um, a system of rain gauges, both direct operated and they use something called cooperative observers. And so the rainfall network in the U.S. is not as dense as you might think, but there are data models uh, that estimate it for any point in the U.S. And that's from the National Weather Service. And I uh, have a uh, picture of a web page here. I think it's probably obsolete, but the Office of Climate, Water, and Weather Services maintains these databases. And you can often find pretty long records of rainfall in a location of interest. A second source of rainfall data is something called the Surface Weather Observation Stations. And every um, airport in the United States that um, receives any FAA input operates these weather stations. And they're, they're, they obtain hourly data. So you can get wind, rain, temperature, solar radiation, a host of other uh, input variables for any airport in the U.S. Um, that's harder to obtain in, in, the, in that concept of creativity on the Internet, but it exists. Um, so here's a picture of a surface weather observation station. And the reason um, airports gather that data, it's not to help us. Uh, it helps you land those big old airplanes without having parts fall off or having them fall out of the sky. And so in this photograph right here, there's some weird looking devices here that look like ET's hands. Um, and these are measuring wind shear. Some, um, and uh, that's important so that uh, when the plane closes to the ground, it doesn't hit a wind shear zone and all of a sudden drop 30 or 40 feet in altitude when it's 12 feet off the ground because you got a few, few hundred thousand tons of aluminum hitting the ground too fast and that kind of makes a, a mess. Although that's a lot of future beer cans. Uh, there's a device that's used in hydrology and agronomy that looks very much like these that can measure um, evaporative fluxes. So uh, these data are routinely collected and available. There's also local gauge networks. So here's an example of a gauging network operated uh, by the uh, Harris County um, Office of Emergency Management. And um, 
They have, by now, probably 40 to 50 years of historical data at these gauges. At the time I lived in Harris County, the gauge network had 106 uh, stage and rainfall gauges. I'm pretty sure it's more dense than that now. Um, and this particular picture shows a website. At the time, you would uh, click on a gauge, and it could pull up information about that gauge. And while it wasn't easy to do, it was possible to, in a matter of a few minutes, obtain uh, data for all 106 gauges for a given year um, fairly easily. Uh, you download it, and then you would post-process it yourself. Um, sources for stream flow include the United States Geological Survey through something called the National Water Information System, um, International Boundary Waters Commission, and then the often still ignored paper-based records, and those are uh, going away fast. With any luck, they get scanned and archived before they're destroyed, but a lot of them go away forever. Uh, so. If you're on the chase for data, don't give up on paper-based records. There's some old dude like me that has them in a filing cabinet in the garage, and you just have to find them. Uh, and then the local gauge networks. So here's a tour of the USGS website. Circa, this is a few years old, so it may uh, look a little different now. And for obtaining data for a particular gauge, um, I'm showing going to a... Uh, to the historical observations tab. And what you're actually doing is building a query on a remote database. So you would start with a tab and then use the uh, search tool to enter um, um, some keywords. In this case, we chose Harris County and Buffalo Bayou. And you can refine that search and it's telling us for gauge 08073600, there are 40 years of record, and um, I wonder if it tells you if it's hourly or not. Oh, peak stream flow. 40 years of peak stream flow. And there's also um, daily discharges, which can be downloaded. And if we look at the daily discharges, there's 14,700 recorded daily discharges in this database. So depending on your needs, you would select which of the categories you want to download and analyze. Um, so for instance, the four-year record, that's actually long enough to make estimates of a 1% annual exceedance probability discharge as per Bulletin 17B, which is now obsolete, uh, the current one, 17C. Uh, that statement is still true. You, that's enough data to probably... Um, comfortably estimate 1% behavior. And when you download a, um, a file, they look something like I have a picture here. I mean, this is an actual one, but, um, and what we're pointing out here is, uh, if you look at the file, you see it's um, organized in columns, and then each column has some informational characteristics of it. And up at the top in the header zone, it tells you what any particular um, special uh, codes mean. Um, so these one, this, there's a whole set of columns on uh, code six comma C. I'd have to go um, look up what the C means, but I think that means urban. And it's unlikely that they changed the gauge datum every single year from 1972 to 1990, so I, that might be uh, a garbled input. Okay, so the uh, first column identifies the agency that um, operates the gauge, in this case USGS. The next column um, identifies the station ID. Um, this is a standard structure so that if the records get separated from this data set, they're not lost forever. So we still know that there is a USGS gauge 080-73600 that in 1984, um, July 18th, 
recorded a gauge um, discharge of 1940 cubic feet per second at a gauge height of 53.12 feet above um, the above the datum, which would probably mean sea level in this case. So the annual peaks are actually organized by water year. So if you're looking through a file like this, it's not uncommon to see two readings in the same calendar year. So water year goes from October to October. So this one that's in July is in water year 84, and this one that's in late October is in water year 85. Um, stream flow gauges come in different kinds of critters. There's continuous record gauges, that was what we just saw output. Well, actually, those were peak outflows, never mind. Um, they usually measure stage, and then the gauge is rated to produce discharge. If possible, those gauges are located at a section where critical flow is known to occur. Um, otherwise, they have to be rated, which in the past, a human being would take an instrument and traverse the stream under different flow conditions, uh, record velocities, and then do a numerical integration to calculate a discharge associated with that particular stage. It's an elaborate process. It's a little more simplified now because it's done by remote control boats using acoustic Doppler velocimeters. Uh, same basic theory, except the person doesn't have to go in the water. And um, it's an elaborate procedure, so it takes a lot of time to rate a gauge. And so you'll notice if you ever visit gauges or look at gauge data, there are entries that occur every time a person visits the gauge and takes time to rate the flow. And that information is maintained in a database and updated as, um, as, as it comes in. And so um, rating curves, once they've been around a long time, don't change much, but early in their life, uh, they'll change a lot at first as the information on the rating um, is added by visits and subsequent visits. There's also something called a crest stage gauge, and its purpose in life is to capture peak stage. There's a lot more of these because compared to the continuous record, these are far easier to operate. Um, they're not super easy to operate because they still require a site visit after every event uh, to survey the debris line and make an independent calculation of discharge for that event. But uh, either gauges um, always have an independent um, measuring device to compare to the electronic recorded device. In, uh, so that they can make uh, corrections to the electronic record. And the general uh, thing is called a DCP, which I believe means data collection platform. The other kind of gauge is called a crest stage gauge. And you may have seen these in your travels around. They look like pipe bombs that are attached to uh, structures um, next to uh, streams. And in this diagram here, there's this pipe that's attached to a, um, uh, a, an abutment or a wing wall on a culvert. And at the bottom of this, this cap down here has holes in it so the water can enter as the depth changes and, and exit as the depth lowers. And then inside the pipe is a piece of uh, wood, and it's not just any wood, it's a uh, special piece of redwood from the United States GS um, Redwood Supplier Company. And that particular wood is used because it's um, weather resistant and it doesn't change dimensions much. And then there's a special uh, cork that's put in here, and it's just a fine powder. It's put in the bottom, and so as the water comes up and goes down, it will deposit a fine uh, line of these cork particles at its highest point, and that gets that gets stuck on that stick when there's a site visit made, 
a pencil mark is made and dated on that particular height because during a year you don't know what the biggest flow is during a year and the analyst visits the site routinely records the cork elevation and resets the gauge um, the slope between several gauges on a stream is used to estimate discharge using slope area method uh, which is this equation right here that's Manning's equation and so they can estimate the slope from the debris line which takes care of that variable um, they know what the stage was so they can estimate both the cross-sectional flow area and the hydraulic radius uh, presumably it's a rated gauge so they can make an estimate of this um, resistance term n and the product of all that produces an estimate of flow and that's what gets recorded as the discharge for that gauge for that particular value of stage and that's repeated many times to uh, construct a uh, record of the gauging station.